Welcome to the show today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I've been on the road a lot, but we wanted to bring you this special interview with our friend and guest, Monica Klein. Um, if you are a new listener to the show, you need to go back, okay? You need to go listen to episode 101 of our conversation where Monica tells her, her whole story. But I think this will be so valuable for you, your family, uh, your church, your community, because we are starting to experience some of the consequences in our country of how we have abdicated the political sphere where we manage these types of ideas and where they come from and who they influence. And you've probably seen lots of viral clips in the last few months of parents blasting school boards over critical race theory and what else? Planned Parenthood sexual education and the type of pornographic material that children are exposed to. Well, Monica knows all about this. She's the former Title X family planning training manager for Planned Parenthood, a volunteer educator for Planned Parenthood, and was trained in HIV prevention, education, comprehensive sexual education, and Title X training. During her time, she came to learn that her quote-unquote mentors, that serving the marginalized meant only meeting them where they're at and then leaving them there. When she began to question what we call comprehensive sexuality education, she was told that if she wasn't pro-abortion, she didn't belong at Planned Parenthood. And so today she exposes the truth behind comprehensive sex education, the harm it causes to children's families and communities, and is now the founder and director of It Takes a Family. And she joins us today to discuss the perverted history of sex education in America and the people and organizations behind it. Buckle up. I'm Seth Gruber and this is Unaborted. <laughs> Monica, welcome to the show today. Hey, Seth. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. We are really looking forward to working more with you and your organization. I told our listeners recently about the Love Life California conference we'll be doing. So for those of you guys tuning in, if you want to hear Monica live and in person in a conference where we bring together fighters to take back California and end abortion, go sign up at lovelifecalifornia.org for January 29th at Calvary Chapel Chino Hills. Monica will be one of our guest speakers. Um, but we wanted to dive into some of these ideas today, Monica, because... Um, we're seeing a lot of disgruntled and frustrated parents in our country right now with the type of ideas and the people who have been involved with their children. And these aren't rock rib conservative moms sometimes, Monica. Sometimes they're just uh, socially liberal a little bit, sort of apolitical parents who are like, what in the world is going on right now? And we've seen some viral clips of moms opening up the curriculum and literally just reading it to the school board. And you see the school board there like, like, uh, like all uncomfortable. It's like, well, you're allowing this at curriculum. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been said that things happen gradually, then suddenly. Or it's in the small things that the rock grows. And when you allow bad ideas to take root in the soil of America or in the soil of the minds of the posterity of America, it will start bearing rotten fruit. But oftentimes we don't wake up to it until we're eating the rotten fruit and we're spitting it out going, how did this happen? Where did this rotten fruit come from? Well, we abdicated those political spheres where these ideas are managed. And so with so many concerned parents right now, grandparents and, and young families in our country, I think it's very important for us to dive into the history of where these ideas come from. Um, I often call these people, Monica, the high priests of secular progressivism. Uh, because we are contending against an alternative religion. And they have their own deacons and priests as well that they look to as the figureheads and leaders of this alternative religion. You have a lot of experience with that um, because you used to be on the other side. Um, so before we have you educate our listeners today, Monica, can you give us a brief primer and preview of your story, where you came from and how God brought you to where you are now? Absolutely. You know, Seth, everything you're saying, it just, yes, I've been following what parents are doing. I have trained parents on how to present to the school board. I have testified at state school board meetings myself. And, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm so happy to see this because I've been speaking out on this since 2009. Uh, so to finally yeah. see parents speaking out and testifying and having this righteous anger. And like okay. you said, from different political affiliations, you know, some of these are, yeah. are Democrats. Um, I recently on my show, the Monica Klein show, interviewed several parents who have children who, I, who have a trans identity. They're not affirming these children in their trans identity, um, but they 
they, they wanted to come onto the show and, and share about their lives and, and, and really wow. just a warning to parents about what's happening and how their children even found themselves in this situation. I wow. say all that, though, to say that many of these parents, or at least one in particular, um, admitted that he was a lifelong Democrat, was a, a liberal, and that he felt betrayed by his party. Um, and, wow. and that really they were shutting him out. His friends were shutting him out because he would not affirm his son's trans identity. So we're seeing wow. families being torn apart. We're seeing families uh, and friends being torn apart. Neighborhoods in my area here in Texas, Leander ISD has been one of the schools where parents have really been exposing not just the curriculum, it actually started with curriculum, um, but really all the library books that are incredibly yeah. pornographic and reading wow. those at the meetings. Um, and many of these parents have had dead animals put onto their patios. Some they've been harassed. They've been stalked. Two of the parents had to move away because they were wow. exposing this. And so to think that there are some, that all parents are against this, no. Many of these parents are surprised to find out that many families actually support this agenda. Yeah. So it is, it is a unique fight that we're facing. Uh, where I came from, I did not start off this way. I came from a very traditional family. Um, we believe that a God existed, but I was not raised in the church. I didn't understand the power of Jesus. I grew up in poverty and in a rural area and was just excited that I was accepted to the University of Texas at Austin and was able to leave my small community and go get an education in big Austin, Texas, where I was groomed where I really was groomed and taught the ways of the world. And as soon as I graduated, I was not only volunteering, but quickly hired at an HIV organization. And this was in the 90s. Uh, so people were really concerned about HIV and, right. and especially in the gay population. And I wanted to do my part to protect people. And so Seth, I wanna really emphasize that many of the educators do believe that they're actually helping people, that they're helping adults or right. that they're helping children. Um, but I do, in my 10 years of working in that field, I would say that there are many people who are not deceived, but that they know exactly what they're doing and they want to separate children from their parents. Um, and so, you know, I was in that field starting off at an HIV organization. I was trained by the gay community. They sent me across the street to Planned Parenthood. So the director of sex education of the greater Austin area, Planned Parenthood, she became my mentor and gave me one-on-one -on -one trainings on how to teach comprehensive sex education to children. Um, and this is what's really revealing, something that she told me. She said, Monica, when you walk into a room full of children, I want you to imagine that they've done anything and everything when it comes to sex. And if they haven't, they will. And it's your job as a sex educator to teach them all forms of sex and how they can reduce their risk. And so that in a nutshell is their view of our children. Yeah. She said it very clearly. They will be sexually active if they not if they're not already, um, and and so and she and she exposed the plan, which is comprehensive sex education, is to teach them every form of sex, yep. and how to reduce their risk by using condoms, lubrication, and wow. because it's not a matter of if you'll get infected with a disease, but when you get infected with a disease, they teach those children how to navigate quote unquote the healthcare system, which is go to Planned Parenthood to get tested and treated for those diseases and to have abortions. And that is the cycle of comprehensive right. sex education. Comprehensive sex education is the sales funnel. It is the marketing tool that right. leads to abortion. So That's when right. they can take our children and they become the parent of our children and they're teaching our children about sexuality and their morals and their values and their beliefs and they eliminate the parent. What they're doing is they're breaking down those inhibitions that the children have. They're restructuring their attitudes about relationships, marriage, family, and sexual intimacy. Um, and then as they are teaching them how to objectify themselves and each other through recreational sex, and it's a natural next step to dehumanize the preborn child and have an abortion. Right. And it's literally, well, yeah. it's, it's literally an automatic thought. Um, I was one it's of those a cycle people. Of dehumanization. It is. It is a cycle of dehumanization. And I will go as far as saying this. And I think there are several reasons why, um, and I don't say this in an arrogant way, but I think that there's several reasons why 
I'm a powerful speaker for this. One, it's not only that I was groomed in this, I was taught this, and then I did it for 10 years, and I know a, a lot of the decision makers in this field, right. but I lived that philosophy. I yeah. am that face. I am like, I'm right. reading all these articles right now, Seth, about, um, you know, what about the minorities? And we need to make sure that people from rural areas have access to health care, which they're really talking about abortion. I'm yeah. that person they're talking about. I'm a Hispanic woman, grew up in poverty, um, had an unplanned pregnancy. And, and basically they're saying, according to CRT, that I'm destined to poverty and to oppression. That's and right. none of those things are true. Uh, so when I faced an unplanned, unplanned pregnancy because of my training in comprehensive sex education, I immediately scheduled an abortion. I did not even think about the humanity of my child until wow. someone humanized my child for me. And as soon as I recognized that my child was real, I became yeah. a mama bear. I canceled that appointment <laughs> and I raised my son on my own. Uh, so I was a single mom for nine years. And so women can do this. Um, was yeah. it perfect? No. Were, were there a lot of challenges? Absolutely. But I was willing to face the shame that my that my family had about me. I was willing to face all of those things because my son's life was more valuable than my comfort. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is what mom and dads do. And That's I right. believe everyone should have that opportunity. We all have the right to have that opportunity. That's right. So I did all of that, Seth, eventually became a Christian, and, and and your people can go back to the previous podcast to find out more about the, the whole story, or they can go to my website at itakesafamily.org and, and listen to my testimony on that as well. Um, but I think today the question is the history. And That's so right. I want to warn your listeners right now, it, it's not going to be an easy history. What you're about to hear is, honestly, it's even hard for me to speak to talk about yeah. the history wow. of comprehensive sex education because it is that yeah. graphic. And I'm gonna say it as respectfully as I can, but this is yeah. a very difficult topic. Yeah. And I want and to take- before you, before you dive into Monica, um, I, I think that, that we need to understand and our listeners need to understand that, that the other side knows how much parents of common wisdom will be repulsed by the ideas that they articulate and promulgate through their curriculum. Terry McAuliffe kind of said the quiet part out loud recently. I believe Governor Virginia, who will be running again, right, with the Loudoun School District, County School District, where a boy who thinks he's a girl raped a girl, like a horrific rape, and they covered it up to try to make sure that nobody saw the consequences of their policies, which are oftentimes based on much of the same types of ideas articulated by these high priests of secular progressivism in this long train of sexuality education. And, right. and you mentioned that people you had worked with at Planned Parenthood and HIV prevention education used to say that parents are a barrier to service. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're articulating uh, that you said and that I would, uh, you know, kind of... Um, add to is that they know that most parents would be opposed to the ideas that they push. Just like Terry McAuliffe is in hot water right now and, and will likely not win re-election, it seems, if we can secure our elections, because of this one issue of the schools and the curriculum being pushed. And he said basically the same thing Planned Parenthood told you. Parents don't have a right, he said, to be involved in the curriculum and education. Now he's trying to roll that back because he realizes, oh shoot, I shouldn't have said the quiet part out loud. So anyways, as you dive in, I just want our listeners to have that in mind, that the other side knows how unpopular they and their ideas are, which is why they have to double down in this moment because they're afraid of that red wave coming in the 2022 elections. Uh, this is an encouragement for every parent. You are the most powerful voice for your child. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, it, it is, it, it is, and that is why I created It Takes a Family, and I'll get into the history, and I'll, and I'll use some storytelling here. When I finally left in 2009, um, I, I started speaking out on comprehensive sex education. I actually went to Waco, Texas, stood in front of Planned Parenthood's Nobody's Full Sex Ed Conference, where hundreds of children were being dropped off to be basically groomed by Planned Parenthood. And I warned, and I, I volunteered there for two years in a row. And I, along, you know, I was invited by a pro-life group, pro-life Waco, and stood with a microphone warning parents what their children were about to learn. Good and that was you. the last year that Planned Parenthood ever had nobody's full in Waco, Texas. <laughs> um, 
and and yes. because because parents didn't realize what was really going to happen in that right. conference, what they were really yeah. going to be taught. Um, and, and I say that because I after that I went home on a weekend and, and I was thinking, how was I deceived? How did I? How did this happen? Like how did I? Uh, you know, like it's so obvious to me now. Why did I fall for this? How did I not recognize that this was unhealthy sooner? Why did I do this? Why did I allow them to train me? And here's the first thing that I remembered. As I was thinking about the way I was trained from the very beginning as an HIV specialist, I kept hearing that Alfred Kinsey was the hero of sex education. Mm. And I kept and I and I and I just accepted that. I never researched who he was. I and just thought, OK, saying. yeah, they're like, great. If it wasn't for Alfred Kinsey, we wouldn't have sex education today. If it wasn't for Alfred Kinsey, we wouldn't have freedoms in the LGBT community the way we do today. If it wasn't for Alfred Kinsey, we would all be repressed and afraid and ashamed of sex. Alfred Kinsey mm -hmm. is our hero. So He's their savior, I finally, right? so. yeah, I finally Googled Alfred Kinsey. And as I Googled Alfred Kinsey, I found a whole series of videos by a beautiful woman named Judith Griezmann. Yeah, who passed and she recently. Has since, yeah. yeah, she has since passed away just this last year. Um, and, and, and actually, I had just talked to Judith the week, the Monday before she died. And, um, wow. and we were talking about having me study with her at Liberty University. Oh, wow. So it was really... She's a beautiful, beautiful soul. All the research yeah. that she did, and she was still one of the most joyous people. Yeah. Uh, she so was probably I, Kinsey's and his philosophy's number one ideological opponent. Absolutely, absolutely. And for many people, her research was dismissed, uh, but not, but not for all. Not for all. She was taken very seriously, um, and her research is, is still being used today. And really, it was because of her research and her series about Alfred Kinsey that I learned about this man. I ended up purchasing his books that he um, published in 1948 and then again in 1953, The Sexual uh, Behavior of the Human Male and the Sexual Behavior of the Human Female. And I bought those books because I wanted people to know that when I spoke about Kinsey, I was reading from his words. It was right. not from, the, from someone else. I trust Judith Reisman, but... People want, you know, we always want to go straight to the source. Yeah. And according so to his believe? research, yeah, and looking at his <laughs> tables, he admits, not that he uses these words, but he admits through his own tables of data that they sexually tortured infants and other minors to get the data that they received. Much of his research was. Um, you know, he, he has table 34 is one of the most famous tables that, um, that supports his conclusion that ch children are sexual from birth. Now, this is important because even Christians today say, Monica, children are sexual from birth. His ideas have permeated our society so deeply that we don't understand what he's really saying. And what he is really saying is that in his research, he had pedophiles sexually torture infants and children um, up to age 18 and, calc and used a stopwatch to calculate the number of orgasms that they could elicit from these children. That is table 34. And there's right. multiple tables throughout his book that show that. And for whatever bizarre reason, society... And even the medical community and the psychological community, the science, ignored, the experts, the science, the experts ignored that, overlooked it, even though Judith Reisman exposed it over and over and over again, even wow. on the Donahue show. <laughs> on Point talk us, shows. Monica, to, to the number one book of Judith and the number one interview of Judith that our, our listeners should listen to. Um, oh, to, sure. to, 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 um, expose Kinsey, what, what, where would you put right. it? Well, I would say that one of the books you can read right away and it would be a very difficult read. And I'm going to tell you right now, parents, if you order this book, do not keep it in a place where your children can read it because it's a difficult read to learn about Alfred Kinsey's past, who he is. Yeah. Um, he, he has passed away and his research, but sexual sabotage 
is a book that that I have. I have all of her books right now, but Sexual right. Sexual Sabotage is a good one. You can also go to her website. Um, I believe it's the uh, Reisman Institute, but but I'll right. make sure you get that link so that you can look at that. And she has all kinds of research on there that you can read. Right. Um, but this sabotage. man. Sexual Sabotage is, is a good book to get from, uh, from, from written by Judith. And so when he did this, this is what justified comprehensive sex education. This is actually what created sex education is that. So there wasn't have... something like that before him. Oh, no, no. So the people before him, Freud was known as someone who yeah. <laughs> uh, talked about sex a lot. Um, but weirdo, he, yeah. <laughs> he actually made, and you can read this in Sexual Sabotage, he made it a point to say that incest uh, and sex with children was absolutely wrong. Um, he was then pressured by many of the elite academics on that stance, including um Alfred Kinsey. And so he, that's when he started talking about, you know, uh, girls being envious of boy parts and things like that, and just kind of right. walked back a little bit, but he never, never, never believed that children were sexual from birth. He never believed that children had sexual rights or that children should be sexually active with adults or each other. Alfred wow. Kinsey set himself apart from everyone by saying that even incest could be healthy as long as it was caring and supportive. And that wow. is in his research. This no isn't anything that is hidden. It is right. in his research. Now, much of his research is hidden, and it is still hidden at uh, Indiana University at the Kinsey Institute, literally behind lock and door. <laughs> No one is allowed to see it. We will have to get a court order to force them to show all of his letters and all of his research. Uh, he had an attic wow. at Indiana University where he did a lot of this research. Basically, it's, you know, just a lot of sexual deviancy that he recorded. Right. And he had where's, a where's Believe All Women? Where's, where's, uh, where's Believe All Women against uh, Harvey Weinstein? Uh, where's the... The left demanding that we tear down any figureheads that represent systemic uh, abuse. <laughs> so he downplayed anything about abuse. He downplayed abuse on women. He downplayed abuse on children. Um, he, in his research, even described that some of these children reacted with hysteria. He considered that an orgasm, not necessarily that they were being tortured and that they were reacting out of, obviously, fear. Um, it is very, very dark information, but all of that research was accepted and it's what created what we see as comprehensive sex education today. And so right. many people are thinking, well, th that just seems so extreme, Monica. Well, all you have to do is go to CECUS, which was created by a team member of Alfred Kinsey, Mary Calderon from Planned Parenthood. The she actually left Planned, Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. Yep. That's right. And she created CECUS, the Sexuality uh, Information and Education um, Council of the United States. Yeah. Council of the United States, yes. Um, and, and in there, I've also, and you can go to my website, where I even pulled some of their research that said that even breastfeeding was sexual with a child. Uh, and that, oh and they gosh. described it in this article, and they completely sexualized a very beautiful uh, bonding moment of a mother it and a really child. Um, and so, and I remember that in my training, I remember that in my training, people would equate the, um, close relationship between parents and children as being their first experience with sexuality. Um, so wow. everything that I was taught as a comprehensive sex educator from the gay community and from Planned Parenthood, all of it rang true when I read the research of Alfred Kinsey, this is where they got it from. They got wow. all of it from him. Um, so they, we create, they created CECUS. They create, he even was recruited to do marriage counseling. Um, <laughs> and so much, yes, absolutely. And so when we look at a, a lot of that, we're going to see his influence, not only in sex education, but even in just therapy for marriage and, 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 and all, all, all of that. Right. And so and you said Judith this beautifully. A, the last interview, Monica, you said that that these people believe that that children have sexual rights to sexual pleasure, and so if they have a right to something, then they have the 
right to be exposed to all of the information in order to exercise that right. Um, and you explained that that was sort of the underlying belief that then justifies, I guess, in their mind, all of what we call comprehensive sexuality education. So from Kinsey, where does it go? We have Mary Calderon from Planned Parenthood. Um, we have another man named Wardell Pomeroy, um, who used to be the, leading the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. Um, right. uh, but who, what are, where from there does it go in this progression towards what we see today? What we see is that they created various boards. Um, there was cool. also, um, and what these boards did is that, like with SICAS, for example, is that they learned how to make sure that their organizations were then part of our government. So they were now speaking into the government. Um, so for example, with SICAS um, and the CDC, um, Advocates for Youth is another organization that's very well known today for that's comprehensive right. sex education. And they have ties to SICAS as well. I call these the the, of the pawns of the pawns of plan the, the spawn of Planned Parenthood and Alfred Kinsey. Like they just started yeah, yeah. creating all these babies. So Secus yeah. is a baby of Alfred Kinsey. Planned Parenthood is the baby of Margaret Sanger. Yeah. Um, and Hugh they, and Hefner then they, provided Hugh some Hef of the seed money to launch Secus. <laughs> right. So he, the Rockefeller Foundation and oh, Hugh gosh. Hefner, it all started with the Rockefeller Foundation. They actually, they were the main um, funders for Kinsey's research. Uh, yeah. Then when, as his information started coming out, um, we see Hugh Hefner going to college as a virgin and he reads Alfred Kinsey's research. And he all of a sudden ha feels enlightened by that and decides he wants to be the, the pamphleteer for Alfred Kinsey. So he created Playboy. Yeah. Um, and so once he created that and was obviously making money with that, he started to also fund Alfred Kinsey, uh, Secus. And so what we're seeing is, that, you know, Planned Parenthood was being funded by them as well. So we see that this, um, these people who really were supporting sexual deviancy and the harm of children are now founding and, and supporting the very organizations that are putting out education standards for wow. our children in the education right. system. Right. So they're the scientific example, organizations. They're, right. the, they're the expert organizations. Yeah, Follow unquote. the science, Monica. Follow the science. <laughs> right. So what we see today that parents are in an uproar is you need to read the national sex education standards. Okay. Those standards have have evolved over the years, created by SICAS at the beginning. Now that we have many different organizations that are working in unison to, to promote comprehensive sex education, they work together to then create the national sex education standards. And wow. those standards align with Kinsey values. Those standards yep. believe that children are sexual from birth and have a right to sexual pleasure and experience, which is wow. why we're seeing that the national sex education standards, and you'll see the acronym at your school possibly, the NSE. S, those are being used and they begin teaching this in preschool. And so people are wondering why so young? Be and again, this is really going back to even a Marxist and communist um, belief system. So if you were to read yeah, the communist manifesto, they believe that children do not belong to the parents, but that they belong to the state. And they want to teach the children their values. So once again, when Planned Parenthood taught me that parents were a barrier to service and they needed to eliminate the parent, well, the communists say the same thing. We need to eliminate the parent. We need to diminish and extinguish the family. The other thing yeah. that the Communist Manifesto says is that the only way we can destroy the nuclear family is to destroy the thing that makes it powerful, which is their God. So the two <laughs> things that they're trying, that they identify as obstacles wow. and necessary for for getting rid of is the family and the Judeo-Christian God. And so this is why we're seeing that when Alfred Kinsey in the 40s and 50s came out with his books, 
began to change the laws, began to change the medical community, began to change the sexual attitudes of people, we started to see our laws changing. So now all of a sudden we have sex education. Now all of a sudden the schools are starting to say, we need to take that role away from parents. Parents don't know what they're doing. We need to teach them. We're the experts. And so we start seeing all of this as a domino effect, really. And it gets worse and worse. My good friend, Audrey Werner, she is the founder of Matthew 18, and she speaks on this so much as well. And she does a great job. And one of the things that she says, she was actually a nurse in that time. And she, they started telling them, we need, and she was doing STD testing. And they said, you know, we need to do this sex education to help reduce the STDs in the communities. And she said that at first they thought, well, that is a good idea. You know, we we need to help people understand what's going on and, you know, to help protect themselves. Within a few years, as nurses, they recognized with more education came more disease. And they recognize that the education was actually making things worse. And so we're not seeing that anything is improving. The very same zip codes that I was hired to do outreach in, in Austin, Texas, were considered high-risk areas, areas that were um, at risk of HIV and STD infection and uh, unplanned pregnancies. And so that's the, those were the zip codes that I always had to focus on. But yeah. those are the very same zip codes today that still are suffering from high STD rates, HIV rates, wow. and unplanned pregnancy. <laughs> yeah. Comprehensive sex education is not helping. If no. anything, from the data that we're receiving among the children is that it's it. actually making them feel pressured that they have to be sexually active. They believe they're yeah. expected to be sexually active and they're putting themselves at risk. But I, I kind of got wow. kind of went that way. But but when I when I was talking about the national sex education standards, the reason I bring that up is that when you look, when you open that document, you're gonna see that SECUS, Advocates for Youth, and Answer are the three organizations who chose to put their name on those standards. Great. Say those um, again. SECUS, Advocates for Youth, and Answer. Okay. And when you open the document, you're gonna see their logos on the document. Advocates for Youth has had contracts with the CDC for years in their Department of Adolescent Sexual Health. So to think that this is not part of our government is is to be very naive. HIV prevention, STD prevention, all of these things are coming from the government. So the CDC is behind this. So as an HIV educator, eventually became a manager, I was sent to the ST, I was sent to the um, Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, to choose my evidence-based interventions to combat HIV in the community, and so I chose my my two prevention interventions: one for women, one for men who have sex with men. And my question was this: What makes these evidence-based? How do we know this works? Right. And they said, self-report. So the number one thing that comprehensive sex education or HIV prevention does is that they're, they want to reduce people's risk by, by uh, asking them to use condoms consistently and to use lubrication with the condoms. Um, and that's the big behavior change. That's what they're aiming for. And so the self-report is basically people in high-risk communities are coming back with, for an incentive like a grocery gift card and they're doing a pre and post you know, test evaluation you know, on this program and saying whether they use condoms or not. And that, that is their evidence-based intervention. It's that simple. <laughs> it is self-report. Yeah. We're trusting- This is the, the scientist. Pe- yeah. That's the great science. And I, and I yeah. literally looked at him and I was like, really, that, that's it? And they're like, yeah. yeah <laughs> like, that's it. You knowing know, Monica, my that population- actually- that reminds me, um, it's the same thing they do with abortion, and it's the same thing they do with the gay marriage debate. And so, have you heard the studies where people say, actually, this study over here, Monica, shows that children fare just as well or better when raised by gay parents than by, than by opposite sex married parents. And you go, oh, wait, what? How is that possible? And you know what they rely on? They go ask the gay parents, how do you feel you're doing? My friend Katie Faust um, of Them Before Us talks to this. How do you feel you're doing as a parent? Oh, we're doing great. We're doing wonderful. And then the opposite sex parents, they're just more honest. They say, yeah, yeah, this is hard. You know, being a parent's hard. You know, they're more honest. And so that's the same thing. They're just, you're self-reporting from the very community um, that you're relying on for your data. 
as if that that is proof and pudding <clears throat> that that your science is, is is and they do the same thing with abortion they say oh if you just get on birth control hey pro-lifers why don't you just push a ton of birth control that's the way you end abortion uh, when really we know that 30 to 40 percent of women who get abortions report having been on consistent birth control use the month that they got pregnant. <laughs> so you're Absolutely. just, to your point, you're causing the same cycle of dehumanization, treating as sex is just for pleasure, and that you can separate sex from pregnancy in your mind. And then when you get pregnant, you go, wait a second, I didn't agree to this because I didn't consent to pregnancy. <laughs> so anyways, to your exactly. point. Exactly, exactly. And, and I just read Katie's book as well and read that as well. And I, and I thought, oh my goodness, they do Phenomenal. it in every area. Yep. Um, so we can't trust their data. Um, I also dug into the Texas Teen uh, Pregnancy Prevention Program and read all of the findings of those programs that the government is recommending that we use in different states. Once wow. again, um, most of them had either did not have an impact on the kids at all, or it made things worse. And the only thing that they measured, once again, is did you use a condom? They wow. didn't measure whether the children avoided uh, disease or not. They didn't measure whether there were pregnancies or not. It was just self-report. So we are spending millions, probably billions at this point of, of dollars, taxpayer money, to indoctrinate children across this country and encourage them to be in high risk behavior. But not yeah. just that, we're also changing their attitude about sex and their belief yeah. about relationships and marriage and family. And that happened in 1971 when Alfred Kinsey had the SAR, the sexual attitude, uh, I think what he called it, restructuring. And he literally had uh, students come in to, you know, a, a seminar, uh, not really a seminar, but like a big conference room, had 14 screens across the room where he exposed these students to hardcore violent pornography. And this was his way of restructuring their attitudes about sex. So he wow. basically changed the way they thought about sex because our brains are working yeah. when we're watching that kind of uh, imagery. And it's changing the way we feel yeah. and think about sex, ourselves, and relationships. Yeah. And that is basically what is happening with comprehensive sex education in our schools to our children. It is changing their brains and it is traumatizing them. Yeah. People don't think that it is, but it is traumatizing our children. They are being sexually abused mentally by being exposed to this day after day in the schools yeah, because it's right. really not just a one day thing this is be their preschoolers are being indoctrinated this is an ongoing thing they have it in yeah. the libraries it's in their books yeah. it's the conversations yeah. in their room and they the want other them hooked things, on it they want yeah. them hooked on it and the other thing Seth is that when a child begins, one, one of the things that the director of Planned Parenthood also said was that, Monica, one of the first things you need to do with these kids who are apparently, in her opinion, all sexually active, is that they're not going to tell you that they're having sex. They're naturally inhibited. So she admitted that they were inhibited, but she wouldn't admit that they were not sexually active. So she mm -hmm. said, you need to expose them to sexual terminology to break the ice and get them comfortable to start talking about sex. And so, you know, she, she had me go through this uh, icebreaker wow. with the kids to get where basically they were needing to, um, the instructions were to shout out all the slang terms for sexual body parts and sexual positions and all kinds of things. And so by the end of this icebreaker, we have this easel board or a whiteboard full of dehumanizing terms about their body and sex. So we just right. taught them how to dehumanize each other. And yes, yep. by the end of the activity, some of those kids were giggling. They got a little more, you know, they were nervous, to be honest. They were right. very nervous about the whole thing. But the authority in the room is telling them to do it. So they do it. Yeah. And then they go into the rest of the program where they expose them to sexual scenarios. and Because now the kids uh, are interested. You pique their yeah. interest. Yep. And, you know, and, and the thing is, is that our children are, are naturally born where they're, they're, they're going to submit to authority. So yeah. when we teach our children, Seth, that a stranger can come into your classroom and teach you about sex 
and expose you to all kinds of sexual content and say horribly dehumanizing things about sex to you, yep. then how is that going to be, how, how is that going to help them discern when a trafficker approaches them? Yeah. How will then, will they think it's odd that a teacher in the hallway talks to them that way or in the yeah. locker room or a coach or an adult in the community? They're not going to be able to discern that because yeah. sec, because it's now they've been taught that it's okay to say these kind of things, yeah. perverse things to each other and that adults can talk norm. to you in that it's way. It's normal, right? They think it's, it's normal. It's part so of it how really... human beings function. That's what they think. I, if I, I had to remind my son the other day, Monica, that Darth Vader doesn't actually exist, right? I had to I had to remind him that there actually is not a Darth Vader, um, and he's like, no, he's at Disneyland. It's like, no, that that's also pretend as well. There's not actually a Darth Vader. There's not actual Jedi's. Um, you tell a kid stuff like this, he's just going to believe that it's true, um, and, and of course, but this is what they want, right, Monica? Because if you can appeal to people's most base, animalistic desires, it prevents rational and logical thinking because we are embodied human beings we are both body and soul but if you can dehumanize the individual just down to their bodily functions and pleasure centers then you can control and upend society by getting people just addicted to sex to images and to um, you know mental highs uh, and that's what they've always wanted is to upend society and recreate it in their own image through the science. <laughs> right. And they know that adults, although many adults have been groomed in many ways, we're very used to seeing things in the media, movies and music. Uh, when Cuties came out, one of the things that Gosh, in addition to that. the movie itself being so inappropriate and, and, and just, uh, it just, you know, breaks your heart to see that and to know that these little girls were told to do those things. Yeah. But the other thing that bothered me is that I recognized that even us in society, we're going to be in, have even less inhibitions. Like we're going to see cuties and now we're going to be like, well, what's the next thing? You know, what's the next right. thing? What's the next thing? Um, yeah. Even if we don't like it, we are getting accustomed to it. The and our children are normalization. Yeah, it's becoming so yeah. normalized. And, uh, you know, in, in what it's doing, what pe people, I don't know if people are understanding at this point in the podcast, is that not only are they doing this to the children, they're, they're doing it because they know that they, these children are tomorrow's leaders. Yep. And if tomorrow's leaders dehumanize themselves, and if tomorrow's leaders are able to not even blink an eye that we're killing preborn children in the womb. Um, because what does it matter anyway? Marriage is a farce. Family is a farce. Uh, raising children is, is ridiculous. Sex is not really about intimacy. If, if our children are learning that, then everything that we do today will be undone by our children tomorrow. And so as we're going to school board meetings, as we're running for office, as we're trying to create policy to stop some of these things, and we need to continue doing that, as hopefully our pastors start speaking on this more from the pulpit, we also need to make sure that as parents, we are the leading voice in our children's lives. Because we need to go back to what that realization I had. Not only did I look back and think, you know, how was I groomed? Oh, it was because Alfred Kinsey. Well, not just that. Then the next thing I realized was they always told me parents were a barrier to service. And that's when I realized that's the key. They're mm -hmm. actually afraid of parents. They're yeah, afraid right. of the nuclear family. They're afraid of mom and dad because mom mm -hmm. and dads are powerful. And that's why I committed myself to starting It Takes a Family because that is the key. It's family being the leading voice in our children's lives. And so we need to be sure that we are educating our children's properly at home. And at this point, I'm going to take that bold step, Seth, of just saying, I don't believe children should be in government schools anymore. I believe that our children are being abused on a daily basis, eight hours a day, five days a week at that mm -hmm. school, and they cannot handle it. And our children are not going, There's. I don't think we should be surprised that there are generations of kids who are no longer believing in God because they spent most of their time at a government run school yeah. that has voted God out 
of the school. And so we, as parents, have much less time with our children because they've been in public school for majority of their lives. And so it's not a surprise that they're starting to believe these things. You know, Seth, the the case that you talked about and about the young woman, a young girl who was raped at her school. Um, At the end of, I think it was the Daily Wire, maybe their article about it. At the very end, the parents admitted that even though um, she was obviously traumatized and harmed by this rape, their daughter was still co- still considered herself woke, and she still believed in, th- in in this what we call indoctrination. She was believing in it. She supported the transgender identities. She obviously did not support you know this, this sexual violence, um, but but she still was supportive of those things. And her parents were just so broken hearted because yeah. she couldn't see past this woke ideology. Right. And so this well, that shows you the power of ideas, right? The power of ideas. And that's why the left has slowly but surely, for the long game, been taking over the educational institutions. Because they know that if you can indoctrinate children while they're young, they'll serve you forever. And yet that that rape at the Loudoun County is just the natural progression of their ideas. They believe that the body has nothing to do with the real you. This is an old heresy called Gnostic dualism or body self-dualism. So the real you is your soul, your, your, your desires, your, your subconsciousness, your self-awareness. So our bodies are not the real us, they believe, Monica. So it doesn't matter if you were born with a male genitalia. If you feel like you're a girl inside, the real you is not the male body. The real you is little Sally inside. Um, and then couple that with what they believe about sex, that it's just for pleasure. Our bodies aren't the real the person anyways, and it's all about maximizing pleasure. In which case, what can they say was wrong about that rape? Because that little girl, her body's not the real her. Her, her real body is her soul inside of her. That boy is actually a girl, and he's just maximizing his pleasure. She has no basis philosophically to complain about what happened to her. This is the natural progression of all of their ideas. But then deep down, we all are kind of repulsed by that. But the high priests of secular progressivism who are behind all of this, Monica, they try to bury it. Why do they try to bury it? Because they believe what Planned Parenthood believes, which you so eloquently articulate, that parents are the problem. They're the barrier. We can't let them know what found, what to find out about what happened because they would represent the most ideological, powerful opposition to our political project, which is why we love what you do with the takes of family, parents rising up. Anyways, keep going. Well, you know, and let's let's take that further. More examples of how parents, how they consider parents are a barrier to service and what they're doing in our government um, to ensure that parents do not have a voice. If you go to the CDC, they have a program called Whole School, Whole Community, Whole Child. You'll see that That's logo right. on. You mentioned this last time. Yeah, whole school, you'll see whole community, whole child. Whole child. CDC. And okay. in on the CDC. And many schools have adopted this logo and this belief system. And it, it, they mention parents maybe once, and they always talk about parents as being a partner with their child's school education, not the leading voice, but a partner. Uh, <laughs> they want to provide medical care. They want to provide mental health care. They want to provide a dentist. Basically, they want to provide everything for your child. And all they really need now is a dormitory because the parent is not necessary. Uh, The parent is considered uneducated, ill-equipped, and they just need to stay out of the way while the state raises their child. We also see that many of the bills that are being introduced to legalize, um, you know, gender modification or surgeries, really genital mutilation of children who have trans yep. identities, those bills will say parents are a barrier to the health care of their children. That's and right. uh, the CDC also has, you know, adolescent confidentiality. That's a big yep. part of what Kinsey did as well, is that we need, adolescents need, according to them, need confidentiality. That confidentiality really, it means we need to keep parents out of the picture. Yeah. That's really what they're talking about because the uh, the school, the clinic, everyone there is going to know what's happening to that child medically. We'll counsel the the kid into that decision. Yeah. Right. (laughs) The only institution that they want to (laughs) eliminate from knowing what's happening with the child is actually the family. So we're seeing that happen. Parents, when you go to your doctor and they want time alone with your child, absolutely not. Screw you. Uh, Fire them. Yep. Yeah, fire them, go to someone else. Um, well, in so, California you know, right now, Monica, Newsom just passed a bill. You saw this. This is freaking crazy. I talked about it on the podcast last week. 12-year-olds can now charge abortions and 
gender affirming surgeries, quote unquote, to their parents' health care plans without parental consent or knowledge, and the and the and the, the health care provider is not allowed to t- to inform the parents. So so now California parents, your children who may be sexually active because they're being groomed in public schools, can now charge your health care plans to murder your grandchild or to chop off your child's genitalia. And not only can you not know about it and should you not know about it, but you're going to be forced to subsidize it. Welcome to secular progressivism. Uh, another example of, of, of the state stepping in. And, what, and you, you know this, communist regimes would encourage children to rat on their own parents. Yeah. I mean, to your point, you always go after the, the nuclear family. Black Lives Matter Incorporated, before they took it off their website, we exist to disrupt the Western contrived notion of the nuclear family. And, and that is always the goal, is to diminish and to eliminate the family. Um, again, Communist Manifesto says that the best way to do that is to get rid of their God, which means infiltrating the church and changing the beliefs in the yep. church. It means either intimidating the church and Christians to the point where they do not speak at all or changing their belief system. So now that they are woke Christians who are accepting all these ideolo- all these mm-hmm. ideologies, yep. I've always said that the only parent that Planned Parenthood loves is the parent that agrees with their ideology. Otherwise, you're an enemy. You're an yeah. enemy to this entire, mm. uh, you know, yeah. regime uh, uh, that that is trying to acha- attack our children. Well, just like uh, the only women they like are pro are pro choice women, not pro life right. women. So it's about ideological uniformity, not women. <laughs> right, right. So what we're seeing today, and what we're basically what I wanted to really get your listeners to see is that here we see Alfred Kinsey in the 40s and the things that he did and how he's impacted our laws, how he's impacted our education, how he's impacted even the American Psychological Association, all of that. His research is infiltrating our churches even. Um, we wow. see that happening. And what you see today is the national sex education standards that were created by the very organizations that were spawned by his research. And so what you see in history is now you're seeing the fruit of it today. And those NSES, I think it's just a matter of time that the CDC will officially ratify them as their standards. I mean, they're they're essentially what the CDC believes as well. Yeah. But that means that they will they will ba- basically mandate mandate that throughout our country. So for years they've been trying to do this is by either getting third party organizations to come in through school boards to teach the children. They're also trying to change state laws. When they can't change laws, they're also trying to change uh, the state education standards. Many states now have the national sex education standards as the health standards of their entire state. And so your children are being taught this. No longer are you going to see Planned Parenthood necessarily coming in as a third party provider, but because now it's just part of the education standards of your your government run school. And so your children are going to learn it everywhere. It's the culture now of your school. And With this is why I'm bureaucrats saying, that we can't vote out. Right. And you can't vote out education standards. So, so they've been very uh, strategic about this because the education standards have the power of the law without being the law. Yeah. And so once those are in there, they're really hard to get out. So compromise is not an option when it comes to our children. We do not compromise. We do not co-parent with the government. Right. We do not compromise with them as well. Yeah. And we do need to start being not only the leading voice in our children's lives at home, but in the mm-hmm. community and right. through policy. And That's our right. children will see us leading in that way. And that yeah. is important. And even if they don't understand it, because many are, of our children are uh, in, indoctrinated already. One of the things that um, one of the moms uh, shared in the podcast of the parents who have trans identified children is that there is there are some children who desist, where in other words, that that term means that they stop believing that they're the other gender. And so that's the, the majority. Three, Right. If not the, exposed to surgical intervention and social affirmation. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's true. Naturally, yes, they do. Well, the case studies show that they, they basically outgrow it if they're not affirmed yeah, in that way. 95% or something. But the ones who were basically groomed into believing that, 
the way that those parents were able to help their children desist was, and it's going to sound extreme to, I guess, people who are not willing to be very bold, but this is your children we're talking about. They pulled them out of the public school system. They removed all internet and they also removed them from their, from the, the friends that they had. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of like when you're a, a drug addict and you have to basically stop going to the nightclub or you can't go to the bar because you need to stay away from the things that are actually hurting you. Yep. That's all they did. And these yep. children are now thriving. They're yep. happy. They're no longer depressed. Uh, yep. they, they are relieved. Uh, they don't identify that way in any way, yep. in any way, but it yeah, took their parents Monica- taking bold action That's to right. protect their children. And it because is time. ideology can be just as intoxicating as alcohol. <laughs> and so if the ideology is what's intoxicating and ruining your children's lives, you need to treat that just as seriously as you would treat a drug abuse problem. So couldn't agree more. You know, I, I want to make it a little personal here. I think a big reason that I finally realized that all of this was wrong, well, there was two reasons. One, I had my own son, and two, I did come to Christ, and then my eyes were able to see clearly what was really happening. But it was that mama bear instinct that said, absolutely not, you are not going to do that to my child. Um, And that is why I raised him differently. Um, Now, he was still exposed to many things. He's now 22. So there are many things that, that, you know, uh, that he believes that I'm like, goodness, how, where did you get that from? (laughs) But, you know, but my point is, is that I, my parents are mama bear and papa bear. They just modeled that to me. There was no way that anyone was going to try to raise their children because it, that we belong to them. And that yeah. is the attitude that we need to have. We need to reclaim parenthood. We are yeah. educated. We are uh, equipped. And there is no one in this world that your child wants more than you. Yeah. Your, uh, your children, whether they roll their eyes at you or not, the truth is, is that they want to be loved by you. They want to be protected by you. They want you to set boundaries for them when they're not able to set them for themselves. They're yeah. going to complain about it. But the truth is, is that within 15 minutes, they're going to be crawling into your lap, even as teenagers, because they love that you set a boundary. They That's want right. to know that you love and value them enough to make the hard decisions. Yeah. And I'll support you in that. I know, Seth, you'll support parents in that as well. That's right. And it is time. It is time to be very bold. And I'm very pleased to see many of these parents be bold enough to speak out in the board meetings. Um, yeah. I was one of those parents at the very beginning when people would say, oh, you need to follow the process. You need to this. You need to that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to follow anything because that's my kid. That's, that's right. my child. And you have, you, the school district, you yeah. have the privilege of educating my child. And I'm going to respect you if you respect my family. That's right. But otherwise, I don't need to jump through your hoops in order yep. to protect my child. And that's what we're that's seeing right. from parents today is that they're being bold in protecting their children. And I applaud that's them right. for it. Amen, Monica. That's exactly right. Listen, you guys, I don't, I don't know how, what else Monica and I can say to to wake you up to this reality and help you to wake other people up to this reality. But these scientific organizations, these experts, okay, they are activists, okay? They are secular progressives with an activist agenda. And I've been starting to say this recently, Monica, science is a sticker that they slap over their bigotry to hide the reality of their agenda. It's a sticker that they slap over their bigotry to confuse the American public into believing that it's just the science. Right, well, if Kinsey's belief were scientific, okay, then then I don't want to have anything to do with your science, okay? You can take that science and shove it where the sun don't shine, okay? And you can sit down while parents stand up and begin speaking on behalf of their children. This This is our children we're talking about. This is the posterity of America. If you send your children to Caesar, don't be surprised if they come back as Romans. Vody Bakum brilliantly says, you were sending your children to an alternative religion with very deep philosophical underpinnings and very strange religious premises that animate their activist agenda. They just call it science to confuse and shut you up. The CDC, the FDA, the AMA, the, uh, the ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, th- those are just some. Um, These are all pro-abortion groups. (laughs) 
and they're all pro transgender religion, which is that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. That doesn't sound very scientific to me, Monica. <laughs> and then now we're seeing how this other side responds, Monica, when the parents start waking up. How do they respond? Well, the Attorney General of the United States of America calls them domestic terrorists. Right, because they understand the threat that parents represent to their regime. Maybe the most oppressive threat to their regime, because they're the primary formative individuals in their children's lives. The children, the posterity, the future of the country, the, the group that the left needs in order to prop up and sustain the lifespan, lifespan of their political regime goals and project that they're trying to pull off. So I'll put the cap on it in the way that I just did, that that's what we need to recognize we're contending against. And for the woke Christians amongst us who say, ah, I, you know, I got to trust the science, um, you need to understand that you are being deceived. You are being tricked. You are being used as a prop in their political regime and theater. And they love nothing more than parents siding with them, to your point. They like pro-choice women and they like parents who agree with them. But if you're a pro-life woman, or you're a parent who disagrees with them, now you're a domestic terrorist. <laughs> so, um, Monica, closing comments, and then, um, and then tell us again next steps for parents. Uh, curriculum to look at to become educated about what we're up against. Uh, resources, such as your organization, and Judith Reisman, or other things. In other words, where can we go to help expose what we're up against, and to equip ourselves to expose it? Sure. You know, you can follow me uh, or subscribe to my newsletter because you never know when social media is going to disappear, right, for the <laughs> conservatives. So please go to itakesafamily.org.org and sign up for my newsletter there. And I can connect you with other organizations that are specializing in CRT, social emotional learning, because there are so many people who are working together to combat this indoctrination of our children. Uh, so, and, and of course, talk, you know, you can call me anytime, uh, contact me about your questions on sex education as well. Um, I, I, the, I think the other thing that I want parents to recognize is that we, I know we are being targeted so much as being bigots and haters, uh, but the truth is, is that the true compassion that we have is that we want optimal health and optimal living for all people. Um, and what we're really calling for is the freedom and the liberty of, that we have in this country to be able to live out those freedoms. And so it is not compassionate to tell someone to stay in a high-risk behavior. It is not compassionate to tell someone that they are not their biological sex. It's not compassionate to yeah. commit genital mutilation on children. Um, and, and it is compassionate to protect children. It is compassionate. I'm doing, my children are already grown and gone, but I'm doing this out of compassion. But compassion yeah. without truth, without absolute truth, can lead down very dark paths. And that right. was what I learned in leaving uh, comprehensive sex education is I had a lot of compassion, but I did not have truth. And so what we have going for us is that we do know absolute truths and we need to use that with the yeah. compassion and love of God to truly help a whole generation of people, including our children, even if they're rolling their eyes. So parents, if you get the eye roll, count it as a badge of honor. Congratulations. You've set a boundary and they love That's you right. for it. Uh, right. So, but yeah, you can follow me on my website. It takes a family.org on Facebook. Uh, either uh, Monica Leal Klein or at It Takes a Family, and I'm also on Instagram. And, oh, and also please uh, listen to my podcast, The Monica Klein Show. The Monica Klein Show, yes. And you have had some great guests on too to really educate parents into what we're up against. You know, what you said reminds me <clears throat> regarding compassion or false compassion. It reminds me of something C.S. Lewis said. Um, if you look for truth, uh, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, uh, you will find neither comfort nor truth. Uh, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin, and in the end, despair. In the end, despair. Uh, and when so you choose the, the perception of comfort and compassion uh, over truth, uh, you will end up in despair. And now we are seeing our children facing more despair than we have in maybe in American history because we have abandoned that, that Judeo-Christian social fabric because their war has been against God, right? Nietzsche said, God is dead, 
and we have killed him. Um, and this is the goal of communist regimes. It's to remove God, remove parents. They become the big brother. They become big papa government who is, can be trusted to educate your children. But it's all about ideological indoctrination, and it's about propping up their political regime. So to get back to the top of the show, guys, abortion, uh, sex ed is their sales funnel. Abortion is their product, and your children are their prospects. Um, and sex ed is more necessary for them to protect their sacrament of abortion um, maybe than almost anything else besides just politics, of course, um, because indoctrinating children into ideology is actually far more impactful in the long term for them than politics because politicians can still hopefully be voted out. Um, but the pervasiveness of these ideas through these quote-unquote unaccountable institutions has a far more pervasive and long-term effect in the future of America than a temporary politician serving in a term does. And that's why, guys, they care so much about sex ed, because the greatest sacrament of secular progressivism is abortion, and nothing animates them and unifies them as a political movement more than when the fictional right to abortion is compromised or threatened. So Monica is contending against that, you guys. She's exposing these ideas, and she's equipping you to stand. I, I, I implore you to listen to her podcast, to sign up for her newsletter, to pour into her ministry financially. Um, and to equip yourself to be your children's most powerful advocate and voice. Because we are almost living through the fall of the republic right now. Um, if you're a domestic terrorist for telling school boards to shut up and sit down, right? And if, and, and, and if did you see on, on MSNBC recently, they compared pro-lifers to the Taliban and to suicide bombers. I mean, these comparisons, Monica, they're not accidental. They mean them. Like, they actually believe that, which means that if we don't stand up soon, is it irrational to suggest, Monica, that maybe one day they'll, they will treat us like actual Taliban and suicide bombers? No, it's not irrational to think that. And we will end up with gulags for re-education. Fauci and some people said recently, Monica, they said that for those who are still vaccine hesitant, we need to re-educate them. They literally use that term. We need to re like. You're talking about gulags, and you're talking about re-education camps. What happens if I dissent from your re-education? Well, then they double down and they insist on it all the more. Um, but your children are their goal. That's who they're after. So, Monica, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll, we'll put links to everything, Judith Reisman, the, the primary organizations, your ministry, uh, and books as well. Um, but, um, yeah, we'll see you at the conference in January. Any, any final, final words for, for parents and, and young, young parents like me? Parents are powerful. Reclaim that parenthood. Your, your children are needing you. And yes, you need to be that leading voice in your child's life. So it takes a family to grow strong children. It takes a family to have healthy communities and form a great nation. So we need to continue to strengthen the family in our country. Amen. Awesome. Well, Monica, thanks for joining the show today. We'll have you back on soon and we'll see you in January. All right. Thanks, Seth. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining the show, to guide days, uh, the show today, guys. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, follow me on Facebook, Instagram. Go to SethGruber.com to sign up for my newsletter, to see my speaking schedule, or to book me for an event in the new year. My schedule's already filling up. Quickly, to connect with Monica Klein, again, go follow her podcast, The Monica Klein Show, which you can find on every major podcast provider, um, and uh, follow her newsletter as well. Please give the show a rating and review. It really helps us reach more people, especially while certain voices are starting to be censored, we want to um, promulgate these ideas and equip you to stand in this moment. Thanks so much for joining the show. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Hey! Hey! Hey!